with judgment speeding toward a nation, here comes this word from the Lord with this strategy and sliver of hope somehow in the midst of it all. Just to a nation that was in gross sin, he comes in and he just says, come back to me. And perhaps there's hope. I just find myself right now with America, our nation that I love, that a lot of people have written off. I realize that we are a nation that in just my lifetime has slaughtered over 60 million children. In just my lifetime, my nation has slaughtered over 60 million children. Can that be ignored? How long will God allow a nation to spit in his face, mock his truth, desecrate his temple, twist his word? How long? Unless as a nation, we can find a word in this little passage, that in the middle of the chaos of this hour, much seems to be hinging on the response of God's people. Not even the response of the world, but the response of God's people. So while the world is looking around for answers, I just believe that even this morning, heaven is looking to see what's about to happen. While the world is looking to see what's going to happen, could it be that God and heaven is looking to see what will happen? Because 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, just searching for somebody he can show himself mighty through. I believe we are in a perhaps moment. I believe as a nation and as a church, we are in a very, a moment that is hinging. A, ba a, a weight in the balance right here. Hinging on our response to this call from heaven and everything is staked on it. In 1949, God's searching eyes found someone, two people. And over these past few weeks, those two people have caught my attention too. I've always heard of the Hebrides revival. Never studied it a lot, ever. Just heard about it. There was a great revival at the Hebrides. Didn't know when it was or anything about it, really. I just heard it was a great revival. It was November 1949. On the island of Lewis, the Hebrides Islands, Islands just off the coast of Scotland. Two ladies. Just saying. Two ladies. Peggy and Christine Smith. They were sisters. Interesting. One was 84 and one was 82. Selah. Peggy was completely blind. Christine was had crippling arthritis. These two women of God <coughs> that were later known, I, I love this that was written about them in history. One writer said these two women, they were little known by man, but well known by God. Oh, come on, don't you want that to be said about you someday? Little known by men. Well known by God. Oh, is that the desire of your heart? <laughs> As I studied them, I found this interesting about their life. It said these two women, 84 and 82, sisters, blind and crippled, became greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their church. Because not a single young person attended their worship services. It said that, and I'm quoting, they were greatly troubled 
by a growing trend of young people toward worldliness. Well, it became clear that an outpouring of God's spirit in revival was the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation. It became abundantly clear that an outpouring of God's spirit in revival was the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation. A verse gripped them. Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. This word, this particular verse, gripped their heart, captured their attention, so they began to pray that verse. When they began to pray that verse, that is when something began to shift. You know why? Because that's the word of God. And when you pray the word of God, you pray the will of God. And when you pray the will of God, you can have whatever you're asking for. Oh, come on! <laughs> it's amazing that this book is full of these promises from God, but these promises will lie dormant on these pages until they are taken off the page and activated by faith out of the mouth of his people. They begin to pray and declare that one verse. God, you said you would pour water on him that is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. God, our church is thirsty. God, our nation is thirsty. Two women prayed it. They were so burdened that they decided to pray and to spend some special time in prayer. So they both agreed that they would pray two times a week on Tuesday nights and Friday nights for this one thing, revival in their church, in their city, in their region. They agreed they would pray twice a week, every Tuesday night and every Friday night. Watch from 10 p.m. to 3 to 4 a.m. every Tuesday night and every Friday night. Did you catch that? Come on, 84 and 82, blind and crippled. We're gonna pray two nights a week, every Tuesday night and every Friday night from 10 p.m to 3 or 4 a.m. every week. Praying one thing, Isaiah 44, 3. One night, Peggy, the blind one, had a vision. Of course. She saw the church of her fathers, I'm quoting. She saw the church of her fathers crowded with young people packed to the doors and a strange minister standing in the pulpit. She was so stirred by this vision that she sent for her pastor. They said she told him about the story and he took her message as a word from God. Turning to her, he said, quote, what do you think we should do? What? She said to her pastor, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to waiting on God. She said, get your elders and deacons together and spend at least two nights, two nights a week waiting upon God in prayer. She asked, the, she asked her pastor to call for the elders and deacons to join him in a barn in their community. And I love what she said. She said, you pray there, we'll pray here. At the same time, Tuesday night, Friday night, 10 p.m., 3, 4 a.m. Y'all pray there, we pray here. The same thing, Isaiah 44, 3. I love that because now that she's activated a principle of the word, the power of agreement. And honey, when you get somebody agreeing with you on something God's already wanting to do anyway, then something is going to shift in the heavens when the word of God comes into agreement and is released. Oh, I felt that last night. Well, this morning early when I was reading this passage, this part, I just, that, whenever I read that about in the history, think about her. You pray there, we pray here. 
It was nine people because that pastor and his men, there was seven of them. Seven of them in the barn. Christina and Peggy in their little cottage praying at the same time for the same thing, a move of God in their church and in their nation. A dead, dry, desperate place. Nine people are praying. You pray there, we pray. They took on their generation with a shared mission. When I read it this morning, I thought of the ramp and Fresh Start Church. We share a nation and we share a mission. And I just come all the way to, to all the way to Phoenix to say, what if we come into agreement this weekend and let me represent the ramp and let me say, we'll pray there, you pray here, and can we believe God can break open the heavens over America? Oh, and pour out water on him that's thirsty and floods on a dry ground. Seven men, praying in the barn. At the same time, Peggy and Christine are praying in their cottage. They continued to pray like this for weeks that turned to months. And, they, and, I, and the, one of the, the people that was talking about this, I read about this morning, said three, went, three months went by doing this every week. Nothing happened. So it was dry. Nothing happened. They just kept praying, Isaiah 44, 3. All of them. Even when nothing was happening and it was dry and it was hard. Nothing, no glory, didn't have music, didn't have lights, didn't have nothing. They just had a strong desire. They had a strong belief that surely God would answer. One night, one night as they prayed, one of the elders in the barn with the seven men, one of the young men began to pray Psalms 24. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? who will stand in his holy place. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto an idol nor sworn deceitfully. And they said, he said these words out of somewhat of a good spiritual frustration. And they said, he turned around to the men and he said, it seems to me to be so much humbug. To be waiting as we are waiting and praying as we are praying when we ourselves are not rightly related to God. Then they said he stopped and turned around and he went, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And they said before he could finish the passage, he hit the floor in a trance, of course, what we would know is being slain in the spirit. And this is the way they said, was what they said about it. They said something happened in the barn at that moment in that young deacon. There was a power loosed that shook the heavens. The bowls of intercession had tipped over. They said when that happened, the power of God swept into the community and an awareness of God gripped the community such as had not been seen for more than 100 years. They said the next day, the looms were silent. Little work was done on farms as men and women gave themselves to thinking rightly about eternal realities. This phrase, an awareness of God. Duncan Campbell went on to say, that was revival.